Why, hello. Welcome to my YouTube video thing. <laughs> my name is Tony, and um, uh, we're here to talk about uh, a, a book called Atalanta Fugians. And here it is. Now, you may be saying to yourself, well, what the hell is an Atalanta Fugians? And we're going to get into that. We're going to talk about that. We're going to explain it. We're going to explore it. Um, it's an emblem book from the 1600s. Well, what is an emblem book? Well, an emblem book is a book that contains pictures. But the extraordinary thing about this book is that not only does it contain text and pictures like a book would, it also contains music, all right? A little piece of sheet music uh, called a fugue, and we'll get into that as well. So it's the first book to do anything like this, and it's really, uh, well, extraordinary. There I go again, saying that same word. But that's okay, because it's true, okay? So um, the person who thought of this is a, a guy named Michael Meyer. Not the Michael Meyer we know, not this guy. But actually, he would write a very extraordinary book, too. <laughs> it would be a lot of fun. But uh, Michael Meyer was a physician. He was a philosopher. He was... A, uh, an alchemist, and uh, he was uh, an all-around kind of cool guy. Sort of a musician, but not really. But anyway, um, so I'd like to take you on this journey um, of exploration, uh, looking into this book, because the book involves a lot of different disciplines. Um, you know, you need to know a little bit about Greek mythology, Roman mythology, Egyptian mythology, philosophy, religion, music. Boy, he covered a lot of bases. And I hope to do a series of these videos. Um, so if you like it, do the YouTube thing. You know, you go down there and you, you know, click on the like if you don't like it, well, carry on, carry on, you know, uh, but uh, don't not like it because that's just, I don't know, mean. And let's face it, mean people suck, right? Who wants to do that? But anyway, so let's uh, delve into the bowels of <laughs> Atalanta Fugians. Well, not the bowels, that's a little too low, but into the depths, how about that? That's a, a little cleaner, not as nasty. So anyway, uh, so uh, come on, take a, take a journey with me here and, uh, it, you know, and, and uh, open your mind and your heart and, uh, and we'll have some fun. The book, yes, let's talk about the book. Um, the book is divided up into what I would call 50 sections, okay? And each section of the book contains a two-page spread. Uh, it has an emblem, all right? You have the title here, talks about the emblem a little bit. And you have an epigram, which uh, is kind of a, almost like a poem. And then uh, this here, of course, is the sheet music. So you've got, you know, the, 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 the emblem, the epigram, and the music, followed by a two-page discourse, typically two pages, uh, discourse on the philosophy and um, the uh, general, in general, very uh, uh, secret, secretive kind of stuff concerning the emblem, and we'll get into that. Okay, so each section uh, has, an, again, an emblem, a, 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 an a epigram, uh, the music, and a discourse. And that's how the book is set up. And why can't I turn this page? There we go. And that's how the book is set up, okay? Um, now, the cool thing about this, if you really kind of wrap your head around this, uh, it, it really is the, the first multimedia presentation, right? I mean, because you've got music and images and text. Now, um, Printing a book of this type back in the 1600s was, was quite a process. First of all, in terms of the emblems, um, before then, you know, I mean, early books, let's say, early books were, uh, were, were actually made out of animal skin, and, and, and people would literally paint the uh, images or, you know, the, the illustrations and, and write out the text. I mean, this is how books were, you know, many, many years ago. 
Um, in the 1600s, uh, the technology had advanced somewhat to printing presses and things like that. So, um, but still, uh, it was complex. Um, most books were, uh, any, any images or any illustrations in, in most books were done uh, from woodcuts. A woodcut is basically, uh, you'd have an artist who would get a piece of wood, carve out the image in reverse, Okay, and then they put ink on it and, 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 and you know press paper to it, and that's how you have your image. Very much like uh, this uh, Jethro Tull album cover. It's well, well when I was a, I was a teenager, which was a long time ago. It was a very popular album uh, and a very popular album cover because this is done with a woodcut. Um, by the time Michael Meyer went to came around to printing uh, Adelana Fugians, um, they had advanced to something called uh, copper plates. So you'd have an artist, same process, an artist would carve out um, the image in reverse on a copper plate, ink would be applied to it, and then they would print that onto paper. Um, now when you had a, 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 an illustration and text on the same page, that was even more complicated <laughs> because you had one printing press that just did text and then you had another that would do images. So they'd have to print the text, you know, leave a blank space for the image, put it on another printing press and that would, that would print the image on top of the text. So as you can see with, um, you know, this, this kind of layout, it's pretty complicated. Um, so uh, it's kind of an amazing uh, accomplishment of what they, what they did here. Um, and of course, as time went on, it got better and better. So that's the basic structure of the book, okay? And now on to the music. The music. Yes, let's let's talk about the music to this enigmatic book. Well, there's another good word. Um, music is a subject near and dear to my heart as I am a musician of sorts. Uh, that's a guitar back there. I'm a singer-songwriter guy, kind of really. But anyway, um, Michael Meyer, uh, uh, we're not really sure if he was a musician. He certainly had some uh, skills um, because uh, of the 50 fugues that, are, uh, that accompany the emblems in Adelina Fugians, um, 40 of them were from other sources. Uh, now, now, granted, he, he modified them uh, to make them his own, yeah, he changed some of the melodic components, so that's kind of cool, right? Um, but uh, apparently he, he uh, only 10 of those are original or, or his own. Um, but anyway, um, so um, these uh, fugues are, uh, are interesting, uh, of course, like everything else in this book. And what I've done is I've taken a MIDI file, played it through my music software, um, so that uh, you can actually listen to uh, some of these uh, fugues. Okay, now while I'm doing that, um, uh, while I'm showing you that, I'm going to also uh, uh, display some of the emblems uh, from the book. So this way it's kind of like the original multimedia experience that he intended. Um, uh, now these images uh, were originally in uh, black and white, all right? They were not uh, colored or painted. Later on, I believe there's some, some people had taken, and, uh, taken them and ma manipulated them, but these are colored by a guy named Adam McLean, who has an incredible alchemy website. And if you're interested in alchemy at all, and I assume you may have some curiosity because you're watching this, um, you may want to check out his website. And he, he is an artist as well, very, very talented artist. And he has colored, hand colored these, uh, these emblems uh, to kind of, it really brings them to life. Uh, so I'm gonna be showing you a few of those while we listen to one of the fugues from music, so this way you're getting that multimedia experience thing. See how that works? But anyway, so I hope you enjoy this um, as much as I uh, enjoyed putting it together. Thank you. 
So who was Atalanta? What is Atalanta? Well, Atalanta is a uh, character from Greek mythology. Um, she is a sure-footed, surely fastly-footed uh, runner. Um, and she uh, challenges any man who uh, wants to uh, marry her uh, to, into a race. And, and every one of them loses. And when you lose, you die. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're killed. Uh, so, uh, yeah, right. But she's beautiful and she's smart and she's got all these great... Uh, great uh, attributes, and, and she's one hell of a runner. So what happens is um, Hippomenes, uh, another Greek character, decides, well, he wants to marry her. So he's trying to figure out a way to do it. So he goes to one of the god, one of the Greek goddesses, and she comes up with a plan and says, look, you know, I'll give you some golden apples. I'll give you three golden apples, and while you're running, if you throw the golden apple on the ground, uh, guaranteed uh, Atlant Atalanta will, will pick up the apple. They go, oh, this is really... It's nice. It's a golden apple. Well, then anyway, so uh, he says, okay, that's a great plan. So he does this. Uh, he challenges Atalanta uh, to a uh, race because he wants to marry her. And uh, so they do, the, they're running and he drops an apple and she stops and picks it up, you know, just like the goddess said that she would. And so this happens a few times and he wins the race as a result because she stopped and picked up the apples. And uh, so, uh, so he, he wins her hand. However, um, he doesn't thank the goddess for the plan, for the idea, you know. And, uh, well, um, they, uh, they get turned into lions, uh, you know, and have to pull the goddess's chariot uh, uh, for the rest of time. God, I hope she was worth it. But anyway, so uh, that's the story of Adelina Fugians. And we'll get into the symbology of the three golden apples, because, of course, you know this. Everything's a symbol in this stuff. Uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, onward. Upward and onward. <laughs> Alchemy. Let's talk about alchemy. <laughs> if I were to use one word to describe alchemy, it would be the word transformation, because that's what it's all about. It's about taking the ordinary, the mundane, and turning it into something extraordinary. Okay, whether it be a metal, a uh, plant, or a human being, it's all about transformation. And um, a great example of this is a... Um, an, an emblem or an etching was done on a copper plate uh, by um, a man named Heinrich Kuhnrath. Um, he was an alchemist and a philosopher um, and a physician, I believe, just like Michael Meyer, um, and from a book uh, called The Amphitheater of Eternal Wisdom. And it's a really, really great book. And he was a very, very uh, deeply uh, spiritual man as well. Well, in this image that you can now see, um, on one side of uh, his work area is an oratory. The other side of the work area is a laboratory, okay? And in the oratory, um, he would pray uh, to God, uh, you know, uh, and, and the universe and that kind of thing, uh, to bring him wisdom and uh, humble himself before uh, God and nature as well. Um, and then he would go over to his laboratory and do the work. Okay, so there's a tremendous spiritual component to this as well for some alchemists. Um, and I suspect most alchemists, except for people who are just trying to make gold, <laughs> and we called them puffers, by the way. There were people who just didn't really see the deep spiritual nature uh, of transformation in alchemy. Well, they just want to make some money. You know, well, you can't blame those folks either. But they were called puffers, and they actually brought alchemy into uh, a negative light, and at some point, um, uh, it was uh, outlawed uh, in society. So that's why a lot of this imagery and stuff is, uh, you know, is, is is symbolic and secretive. Because to be an alchemist, uh, I mean, you could get arrested and, and hanged. You know, it was not a good thing. Um, so going back to this uh, deep, profound uh, spiritual uh, component to alchemy, um, another component to it was um, a deep respect for nature, the natural world, okay? Alchemists respected the natural world. Um, they believed that the, um, all of nature strives towards perfection, okay? 
Uh, that's why we're looking at, you know, turning common lead into gold. They believe that over millions of years, uh, lead would eventually become gold, like coal becomes a diamond, right? And so they also believe that they could speed up the process a little bit by going into the laboratories, employing fire and distillation and all these different chemical processes to speed up that process, okay? But it wasn't uh, like they were trying to, you know, hoodwink nature. They had a deep and profound respect for it, and they were just trying to accelerate that process to bring them to the next step, to bring it to the ne next step. And another part of this we need to talk about is the fact that today the word alchemy is used in many forms. You have, you know, um, musical alchemy, food alchemy, facial scrub alchemy. Well, it's all crap, okay? It has nothing to do with what these guys in the, uh, you know, 12th to 17th centuries were trying to do or alchemists today are trying to do, all right? It has nothing to do with that. Um, it is this process of transformation, okay? Um, and that's a critical component. And the final piece of this um, is um, employing the other big part of our world, and that is the masculine and feminine energies, uh, okay, of our world. Um, you have night and day, uh, you know, good and bad, uh, right? All these different, all these opposites, but they're complementary opposites, most of them anyway, uh, or they're on, on opposite ends of the same spectrum, okay? So they're complementary opposites, all right? So um, as you can see from some of these images, um, alchemists uh, equated um, uh, the masculine energy with the element sulfur, um, and, and then they equated the feminine energy with mercury. And the combination of these two uh, components created uh, eventually something called the Philosopher's Stone, which is that ultimate perfected thing, okay? Um, and it had a twofold purpose. The first was um, that uh, the powder, that it, that it became a powder at some point, a red powder, and that could actually tr transform lead into gold using this powder. Um, and the, perf the perfected entity that came out of the union of the masculine and the feminine, feminine besides being a philosopher's stone, was, uh, was represented by something called a rebus, okay, which is a uh, male-female hybrid. Essentially, you're getting the best of both worlds, which is, hey, that's a really good thing, right? Um, and that is all about balance, harmony, and, um, uh, and, and, and perfection, okay, because the belief was that duality seeks unity and through that unity there is harmony okay so and the product of that harmony was a philosopher's stone the other component of the philosopher's stone was that um as an elixir it was a panacea universal panacea so nobody it would cure all disease um people would live forever and that was another goal of many of these alchemists they were very sincere at least the guys who aren't making <laughs> turning lead into gold for the king <laughs> uh, but they were very sincere about it. It was a very serious thing. They were trying to change the world. They were trying to help people. And that was what this is all about. So as we go through Adelina Fugians, you'll see that Michael Meyer employs a lot of this metaphorical imagery, all right, to express the alchemical stages, you know, the different stages, calcination, distillation, all, coagulation, all those different stages, um, in the development towards the... Philosopher's Stone, which is the ultimate imperfection. If you think of a human being, okay, the, the body is the alchemical flask, all right, and the soul is the Philosopher's Stone, okay, in a, in a very spiritual way, which is people like Heinrich Kuhnrock, Michael Meyer, uh, Robert Flood, these guys were all very deeply spiritual and deeply reverent of nature. So that's what alchemy is about in a nutshell. It's not about facial scrub, okay? <laughs> so here we go, onward and upward, uh, and I hope this all made sense to you, because it is complex, but, and I'm still learning it. I'm still learning about it, so we're gonna do this together, right? Okay. Okay, you're still with me. <laughs> wow, that's really great, <laughs> dodge that bullet. 
<laughs> seriously. I want to thank you for sticking it out with me. Um, this was a this particular production was a lot longer than I anticipated it to be. Uh, future productions will not be will be half this long, because um, I had to cover a lot of bases here. Um, you know, there's a lot to talk about because this stuff is big and it's and it's complex. But anyway, um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I really had fun doing this. Uh, it was really challenging for me because I'm old and I forget. Uh, but I really, I really had a good time, and I hope you did too. And I hope you continue watching uh, my next uh, my next uh, effort. Uh, it'll be on the first emblem of Adelana Fugians. The wind carries it in its belly. Um, very interesting stuff. So stick with it. Um, uh, uh, I'll say farewell, but not goodbye. And I trust that uh, I'll see you soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.